This year, we have started a new motto as a church, a new vision for the year. That vision is everyday spirituality. Every day, getting closer to God. Every day, getting closer to the Word of God. Every day, getting closer to the Spirit. And we have started this year, this new motto, with a brand new series called The Life You've Always Wanted. Let me put it a little bit more like this so everybody can see it. The Life You've Always Wanted. We started last week with Pastor Yang, and he shared with us a um, beautiful sermon. And today we're continuing the ser- that series that he started last week with this sermon called Time for a Change. It is time for a change. Let me tell you a story. So, um, when I was a kid, I was probably like eight years old, my parents were pastors in a church, and I remember that there was this one person, this one elder of the church that everybody was afraid of. He was an elder in the church, but everybody was afraid of him because he would, he would like scream at all the kids, and he would be really mean to everybody. And every, every meeting that we had, like he always had something negative to say, and he was like so strong-willed, and everybody was afraid of him. Even my dad, that he was the pastor of the church, my dad would, would always say, like, oh, I'm a... I'm afraid what he's going to say because I'm like, I don't know how to deal with him. And everybody was afraid of him. And everybody in the church wanted to do something to change this person. But what could you do? I remember the church struggled and, and, and nobody knew why this person was that way. Well, as I grew up, I realized that in every family... In every church, there is people that sometimes we say, I wish that person would change, right? And, and, and if, if, you, if no name comes to your head, maybe you should take a you know, look at yourself. Maybe, no. But I feel like in every family, we have people that were like, oh, man. Like, we were just talking how, Melanie and I were just talking how in our families, we have people that are always so negative. Like, it doesn't matter. We can be in Disney World, having the time of our lives, enjoying a beautiful day, sunny day as a family, and this person is always, yeah, but um, I don't know. What if it starts raining? Like, I, I, everything's going to go wrong. And you're like, man, but everything's so, so beautiful. Why are you like this? In my family, like, you know, there's a person, I'm not going to say who, but there's a person who's always worrying about everything. Like, what if you fall and trip, and, and then, the, the, you know, you trip with the, with, the, with the electric cable, and the electric cable um, makes a spark, and the whole, like, entire carpet cuts fire, and then the whole church dies because of you. You need to be careful when you preach, because if you trip, you could kill the church. Like, my goodness. Well, that person is me, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a warrior. I'm always thinking, what would happen if this happens and everybody is damaged because of what I did? Like, I'm always worrying. Well, today, I want to talk to you about those things that we know that maybe a family member or maybe ourselves have, and we need to change. And since we're starting a brand new year, it is time for a change. Scripture that we read this morning is found in Romans 7, verse 24 and 25. And it says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and by death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ. Our Lord So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. You know, what he's saying here is, I realize there's so many things, so so many tendencies that I have. So many things in my character that I should change. They're bad. There's so many things. And I realize that the only answer is Christ. 
But, but you know what's, how it works? I know that the answer is Christ, and I want to obey his law, but I can't. Oh, I'm miserable. While I was preparing for this sermon, I did some research, and I found that there was a couple things why the author of this book thought that he was miserable. And I was like, wait, that sounds very familiar. And I remember that I had read an article by a very famous psychologist that talked about the seven weapons of self-destruction. These are seven weapons of self-destruction that almost every psychologist agrees that if you let one of these seven, or maybe multiple of these seven, take over control over your life, you're doomed. You're headed towards depression. You're headed towards not being able to do anything in your life, accomplish anything. You're headed towards death if you let this one of these seven control your life. And I want to share with you these seven because I think it's really important before we move on to the answer to these seven um, weapons of self-destruction. The first weapon is shame. And they're not in a specific order. I'm just naming them. But the first one listed here is shame. While we name these seven weapons, I want you to really take a look at yourself internally and say, hmm, maybe I'm being controlled by by this weapon. Because psychologists agree that everybody, absolutely everybody, has at least two or three of these things that control their everyday. So I want you to take a look at yourself and try to identify which one of these sevens are the ones that are really taking control of your life. And I'm going to give you the key on how to handle them. The first one of them is shame. What is shame? Simple. Shame is whenever I feel that something that I did in the past prevents me from doing something in the future. I feel bad because, because oh man, I, like... You know, I sinned this past week, and I knew I should have not done it, but I did it, and now I cannot preach. I cannot be a pastor anymore. How can I be a pastor? I did something shameful. How can I be a pastor now? Maybe you don't, you don't feel that way, but maybe you think, like, I don't know, like, I lied to my wife, or I lied to my husband, or, or I don't know, I shouldn't scream at my kids. I feel so bad. That is shame. The second one, insecurity. This one is very prominent among young ages. There is something about our school system, something about our society that is really pushing our kids, our young people, to feel insecure about themselves. Insecurity. Insecurity is when you believe that you're not enough. No matter what you do, you will never be enough. If I'm being honest with you, this one is one of the ones that really dominates my life. Sometimes I wake up in the morning, I'm ready to, to start getting ready for, for you know, sermon prep, and I, I say I'm going to go to Starbucks, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to start sermon prepping, but then I wake up, I'm like... Why am I even doing this? I'm like, there's people that could do it better than me. There's pastors out there that could, could preach better than I do. There's, there's, there's pastors that could lead this church better than, I, than, than I'm leading these this young people. Why am I doing this? Insecurity. Believing that you're not enough. The third one. Hopelessness. This is the second one that, me, that hits me personally. Hopelessness is the sense that everything will go wrong. There's no hope, right? Hopelessness is when you wake up in the morning and everything, you're having a beautiful day, everything's going great, but you say to yourself, yeah, but, but everything's going good right now, but just, just wait five more minutes and you'll see something will happen because something always happens. A sense of hopelessness. Fourth one, compulsion. Compulsion, I was explaining to the youth, compulsion is 
when you know that you shouldn't do something, but you cannot help yourself. You know you shouldn't be looking at that donut because you're in a keto diet, but you cannot, but you cannot help yourself. You know? <laughs> I, no, nothing personal, Joseph. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't for you. <laughs> that is compulsion. It's this sense that you cannot control yourself. You know you shouldn't, but you can't help yourself. Fifth one, fear. The definition of fear found in the dictionary is the sense or thinking that someone or something is out to harm you. Fear is thinking that, that anything or someone will hurt you or can hurt you. And there's people that live in constant fear. Six one, bitterness. Oh man, I've dealt with some people that are full of bitterness. Bitterness, people that are always in a bad mood. And you bring them flowers to try to make them happy, and they look at the flowers and they, I don't like that color. You're like, oh man. So the next week, you, you, you go to a bakery, and you, know, you go to Paris Baguette, and you get, them some, some, um, <laughs> you get them some red bean bread, and you bring it to them, and they look at it, and they're like, I don't like Paris Baguette. I like Mozart. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to make this person happy. It's just people that are always bitter. People that come to church, and we have a beautiful Saturday, we have a beautiful worship service, but at the end, they always have a bad comment about it. That's bitterness. Number seven, uncontrolled thoughts. Uncontrolled thoughts is when you're at church, and you know you should be paying attention to my sermon right now, but you cannot stop thinking that, you know, tomorrow the new episode of that Korean drama that you're watching comes out, and you cannot stop thinking about it. Uncontrolled thoughts. You know, these are seven weapons of self-destruction. Maybe you have two of them, maybe you have three of them, maybe you have all of them. I personally can tell you that I, after analyzing myself, I fall on an everyday basis having three of them on an everyday basis. And what I learned is that these seven things, some of them seem like not that significant, but any one of these seven can lead you to living a life of depression. And what I learned is that psychologists say that if you don't learn how to control these things, you are more likely to take your life, end up in suicide. Seven weapons of self-destruction. You know, I think when Paul was talking about, you know, how, how he couldn't control himself, he was referring so, to some of the same things that we struggle with today. What are the things in your life on an everyday basis that you cannot control? Are you always under fear? Are you always feeling hopeless? Are you always under shame? Well, I have good news this morning. It is time for a change. And maybe this is something that you have thought of before. I know I have. Every year I make a resolution. This year I'm not going to be negative. I'm not going to be hopeless. I am going to be positive. I'm going to move forward. Nothing's going to stop me. And I start the year, and I start, oh, but I'm not going to be able to do it because, you know, it's just who I am. It's in my head. It's, it's, it's just how, the way I think. I cannot change the way I think. And I've tried to change, but nothing happens. That is because we are not trying to change correctly. Luckily, we have the answer. The answer is given to us in the book of Romans, the very next chapter, chapter 8. 
And I want you to mark this chapter in the Bible. If you have your Bibles with you today, which I highly encourage you to every Saturday bring your Bible with you so that you can double check that everything that I'm telling you and everything that I'm reading is true. Because one of these Saturdays I'm going to just, you know, put there, you know, from the book of Alex 315. And you guys won't know if you, have your, if you don't have your Bibles, right? So I highly encourage you to bring your Bibles. But if you have your Bibles with you, what I want you to do is to go to Romans 8. And I want you to, to mark it, like put a, put a, a bookmark on it or, or anything so that next time you have your Bible in your house or in the car and you open your Bible, whoa, right there, Romans 8. The reason why is because Romans 8, they ask a, a group of theologians, people that are experts in the Bible. They, they took a bunch of theologians from different universities, including some of the biggest Christian universities in the United States, and they asked them, if you are deserted in an island, and you have no Bible, but you can only take with you one chapter of the Bible, what chapter would you bring with you? Did you know that nine out of ten of them said they would take with them Romans chapter 8? Romans chapter 8 is one of the most beautiful chapters of the Bible, because it gives us the key on how to change, how to change our behaviors, and it gives us hope. And I want you to open your Bibles today with me to Romans chapter 8, and we're going to go through this chapter, the beginning of this chapter together. And it says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like our body. We sinners have, and in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law will be satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. This is what he's saying. He's saying, you know, we all have sinful natures. I have sinful nature. This is somebody speaking who has all the eyes of Christianity upon him because he's seen as one of the biggest disciples, one of the biggest teachers of the time. And everybody see him as the perfect person. Him, Peter, John, they were looked upon like like the people to be. Everybody wanted to follow them. Everyone, everybody wanted to be like them. And what he's saying to them is like, <laughs> you don't understand. I'm not perfect. I struggle with shame. I struggle with insecurities. I struggle with hopelessness. I have uncontrolled thoughts. You don't understand. I'm not good enough. But what I have learned, what I have learned is that Christ is enough. And the power of Christ and His Spirit lives in me. I want you to, in your Bible, open your Bible to Romans chapter 8. You're supposed to already be there, but if you don't, if you didn't open it, now is your time to open it. Romans chapter 8, verse 4. And right here, it says, He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied. Fully satisfied for who? Repeat it. For who? I want you to to mark that word right there. For us. Christ came to this earth. And he died. He took our body just like ours. And he died so that the requirements of the law, 
So that every time that you say, I'm going to change, and it doesn't work, like, so that all that would be satisfied for us. Who's the us on this chapter? Because he keeps saying for us, Christ did this for us. Who's us? Well, he says it right here. The us is those who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the, the Spirit. Christ died to free you from being a slave to sin. But he cannot satisfy the fulfillment of the law if you don't do one thing. And he says it right here. Follow the Spirit. Christ can free you from any of the seven deadly weapons of self-destruction. And all he requires for you to be able to be free from them is to follow the Spirit. Chapter, uh, verse 6 says, So letting your, self, your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to a life of what? Peace. Isn't that what we all want? To have peace? Whenever we have an argument with someone and we say that person has to change, aren't we actually just asking, we, we want to have peace with that person, we want to be well with that person? Aren't we, every time that we pray, Lord, just, just, just help this person change, aren't we just asking for peace between us? Every time that you say, Lord, I want to get closer to you, you're also asking for peace because you're asking for the peace of reconciliation between you and him. Peace is what we are always in the look for. Because peace brings happiness. And he says here that by letting the Spirit control our minds, the Spirit leads us to a life of peace. Verse 9. Listen, you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. I want you to realize this morning that we have chosen this motto for the year, Everyday Spirituality, because we have realized that we have fallen into the pattern of saying we are Christians, of saying we are Seventh-day Adventists. We have fallen into a pattern of coming to church every Saturday, and we feel okay with that. But that is not enough. Because the Bible says that if we don't have the Spirit of Christ living in us, we don't have Christ at all. You're not a Christian. You're a wannabe. Let me, let me ask you something. If today, let's say I went to a farm yesterday night, a farm really far away in the lands of Chattanooga, Tennessee, where I come from, and I brought with me a pig. Beautiful, stinky, dirty pig. And I brought it with me to church this morning. And I have it back here. Wait a second. No, I didn't, I didn't actually bring one. But let's say I did bring one. And I bring that, that stinky, ugly pig to the stage. I put it right here next to me with a leech, you know. Have it there kind of like a dog. And I ask you, what animal is this? Is it a dog because it, because it has a leech? What would you say? No. What animal is it? It's a pig. I mean, you can see it, you can smell it, you can even get up if you want and touch it and make sure it's a pig, but it's a pig. So next week, I decide I'm going to trick them, and they're not going to know what's coming. So I grab my pig, I go home, and I take him to a Korean spa, and they make his nails like all pretty, they paint them pink, you know, a good bath, he doesn't stink anymore. I put a wig on him pretty wig, you know. I put some makeup on this pig 
some blush, lipstick, some mascara and fake eyelashes, you know, fake eyelashes. I put a pretty dress and a bow on this pig. I'm like, I'm going to trick them this week. And I bring that, that pig this morning here. Oh, I put some perfume, you know. It smells pretty. Some glasses. And I bring him next Saturday. And I ask you, what is this? What would you say? It's a pig. It's a pig. I've seen people, and I'm sorry if you're one of those. I'm truly sorry. But I've seen people that they trick their dogs like they're humans. But at the end of the day, it's a dog. I can do whatever I want to that dog, and it's still a dog. I can put clothes, I can put makeup, I can do whatever, and it's still a dog. Just like this pig is just a pig. We are sinners. That is our natural nature. Our, our sin, it's, we are sinners. There's nothing we can do about it. You can come to church every week. You can pros- profess with your mouth that you're a Christian. You can say to yourself, I'm going to change. I'm not going to do anything bad. And you can try to follow the law as best as you can. But at the end of the day, if I stand you up in this pulpit today, and I ask the heavenly angels, yeah, they, heavenly angels, angels, okay. If I ask the heavenly angels, what is this? Yeah, I'm going to change the mic. If I ask the angels, what is this? They're not going to say, that's an angel. They're going to look at you and they're going to say, that's a sinner. Especially if I ask Satan and his angels. They're going to point at you and they're going to laugh and they're going to be like, yeah, that's a, that's a very well kept, very pretty sinner. But it's a sinner. But what Paul is saying is that there's a way that we can change that. And the only way we can change that is by having the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit of God living in us. And Christ lives within you. So even through your body, even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give you life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature or urges you to do. For if you live by its, its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. Last verse. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are what? Children of God. He transitioned here from saying, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're all sinners. He transitioned from that to say, but if we're led by the Spirit of God, we're no longer sinners. We are children of God. And in the day of judgment, when Satan stands right before us and he tries to accuse us and say, you're a sinner trying to dress up as an angel, you're a sinner trying to dress up as something you're not, Christ will stand before us with his arms wide open and he's going to say no he's not a sinner he's my child he's a children of God there's three things that we need to do to get rid of the seven weapons of self-destruction number one you have to control your thoughts You have to force yourself and say to yourself, 
I am not going to do that. I am not going to be that person. I am not going to let fear take over me. The number two, you need to surround yourself with a community so that you realize that you're not the only one. You're not alone. Why are you being insecure? We all have those same insecurities. Don't feel bad. This is a community here. That's why God established church. So that we have a family of believers that we share the same insecurities, we, we share the same shame, but we come all together and we say, you know what? It's going to be fine because we're all in this together. The third thing that we need is to realize that there is never going to be any change in us, no matter how hard we work, unless we have the spirit of the living God inside of us. This is how it works. If, I, if I'm in keto, right? I, I'm sorry that I, I take keto as an example. It's just the first thing that came to my head. But if I'm in keto, in the diet keto, I cannot eat sugar. I cannot eat carbs, right? And I have a pulpit right here. And I decide that right here. This is my pulpit. Okay? And somebody comes, let's say Bonner, comes and he brings... I'm, I'm, I really love donuts. Let's say that he brings a donut and he puts it right here. And I'm in a diet and I'm trying to preach. And I see that donut. Do you think it's healthy for me to stand right here next to the donut and be like, <laughs> you're so pretty. It smells so good. But I cannot eat it. But it smells so good. Ooh, donut, donut, donut. Maybe if I just touch you. <laughs> Maybe if I just... That sugar. Okay, maybe just one bite. Uh, is that good for me? I'm not going to be able to keep my diet. But if he puts that donut there, and I say to myself, that donut is going to do nothing to me. And as a matter of fact, you know what? I'm going to put the donut there, and I'm going to keep preaching to you guys because that donut is not going to distract me because I'm in keto. There's a difference there. You need to be able to tell yourself, these are the seven things that are messing up my life, and it's time for a change. So I'm not going to let these seven things take control over me anymore. They're taking a back seat. And from now on, there's only one thing taking control over my life, and it's the Spirit of God. Have you ever longed for something? Have you longed for something? I long for something that we have in Puerto Rico called pana. In English, they call it breadfruit. Oh, man, I, I long for that, for that beautiful vegetable that is called fruit, but it's a vegetable. Um, it's this green. It's a green, like, big thing like this. It grows in a huge tree. It's heavy. And out of it, like... There's like this, like, kind of like a potato texture that you fry. Oh, oh, man, it's so good. I haven't ate a panna since I was, like, probably, like, 12 years old. And every time we go to a, super, a new supermarket, I always ask, do you have breadfruit? Or I always look for the breadfruit. And believe it or not, the first time we came here to this church, that, we, that weekend... We, somebody told us, oh, you have to, you have to go see H Mart. And we went to H Mart, and there it was in the entrance, that beautiful breadfruit. I was like, Melanie, Melanie, they have breadfruit. That means that when we move here, I can buy breadfruit, and we can cook it, and I'm going to be happy. <sighs> well, we moved here. We went to H Mart this week, and they didn't have my breadfruit. And I asked, and they didn't even know what it was. I was like, but it was right here. What do you mean? It was right there. Nobody knows what it was. So I long for my breadfruit. Have you ever longed for something? Did you know that God longs for something? I want to read this quote to you. 
is found in Christ Object Lessons, page 146, if you want to look for it. It's a beautiful quote. And he says, You need not to go to the ends of the earth for wisdom, for God is near. It is not the capabilities you now possess or ever will have that will give you success. It is that which the Lord can do for you. We need to have far less confidence in what man can do and far more confidence in what God can do for every believing soul. He longs to have you reach after him, after him by faith. He longs to have you expect great things from him. He longs to give you understanding in temporal as well as in spiritual matters. God longs, just like I long that beautiful fruit, God longs for you to reach after him, to seek for him. And for that reason, this year, we are focusing on everyday spirituality. Because we have realized that we have fallen into the crack of being everyday Christians, but not having a spiritual life with Christ. We have fallen short of not asking for the Holy Spirit to be in us. And if we are to be able to defeat our sinful nature and become somebody new, if we want that change to happen, we need to become spiritual people. You want to be a new person? You want to have the life you've always wanted? The life you've always wanted will only happen when you realize that you need God in your heart. Spiritual matters are important. And for that reason, this entire year and this series in specific, we are dealing on how to become more spiritual persons, more spiritual people. So throughout these upcoming weeks, as we continue this series called The Life You've Always Wanted, I want you to keep these seven weapons of self-destruction in your head and say, you're not going to control me anymore. Because I have the spirit of Christ, the spirit that raised Christ from the death. I have it in me. And we're going to learn how to continue to grow with that spirit in us to become a new person. Because it is time for a change. May God bless you.